this is just um, something that you have to say. There's a word that I want you to listen to tonight. And when this word comes, you can be creative, you can follow God, but you, this word drives you. Some of you, it's going to get in your heart tonight. You will never be the same after this message tonight. It's not the message itself, it's what God's going to do with you. That's really hard because I would like to just have a fun camp. Honestly, at 58 years of age, I don't want to come and push something. But I'm, a, I'm not, I'm a man of God. I gave my life to Him. He's done a lot for me, but it's cost me a lot too. And so I have to be very truthful with some of you. Some of you hold back because you know if you really give it to God, it's going to cost you something. Your life's not going to be normal. It will be exciting. It will be powerful. God, God is an unbelievably creative God. God will do things with no money. God will heal people before your eyes. I was doing a drama. A drama. How stupid is that? It's actually a human video in El Salvador. It was a drama about, about a man in the Bible called Bartimaeus. And he was blind. And I had a whole big team of people. And one of my guys was sitting on the stage. He was so amazing, man. He was so amazing. His name was Chris, and he could roll his eyes back in his, high, in his head, and it would just seem white. That's why I had him do this. So you have a guy sitting on the stage that's so talented, all you see is white. No eyeball. It's like unbelievable. And he's looking at you as the blind man. And we're doing the drama, and it's, it's called I Want to See. Yo, get over there. And he cries out, and before we came in, we walked down the street, and there was a man sitting there, and he was begging. He was begging. I cannot walk. I always have to give to him. So we go, well, you don't know that can be, oh, man, dude, just leave me be. I did not want to walk through life and walk by everybody and make some excuse why I can't give. I would rather be swindled than to not give. When you stand in heaven, if they wronged me, they got to go to God. But if I miss God, big thing. You don't have to be that way. But I have to. And I remember saying, hey, we're having a church service. Would you want to come? It's in El Salvador. And we came inside and they set him in the back of the room. And I forgot we were doing this drama. And service started. And Chris is sitting down here. And the song is playing and we're doing the human video. Chris's eyes are rolled back and he goes. And the song comes to a point where it goes, I want to see. And Chris goes, Yo, get over there! And the man in the, the man in the back of the room goes, Yo, get over there! I'm like, oh my God, this is for real. Do you know tonight is for real? And that man's eyes opened up. And he stood up and he came down to the front. That's God. It's called a sense of urgency. Urgency. And when you feel that sense, something's going to happen. When you feel it. I don't feel it all the time. To be honest with you, I wasn't aware of it. I was having a pretty good day. And after supper, I went down and I started to pray. A sense of urgency came. This year, Eli Manning, he's a, he's a born again Christian. He plays quarterback for the New York Giants. And partway through the year, they were, uh, they were losing. And they weren't doing that well. They were in the middle of their season. They were struggling. And they had a guy come. He came to, their, to a little chapel that they do. And a lot of times, football players don't all go to the chapel. But this time, more people went because they were losing. <laughs> and Eli's a quarterback, and he said, look, dudes, we need to go to this chapel because we need to go there and ask God to help us. Maybe God will give us a word. And so most of the people went this time. It's funny what you do when you're losing. They went to the chapel, and the guy that came to speak, he wasn't a football player. Kind of like I'm not a Canadian. He, uh, he, didn't, he was a teacher in a school 
it, it, it was a private school. <laughs> you know, that's worse. He was a high school teacher. And he didn't bring a Bible. I know that's a big thing because we talked to him bring a Bible and we're going to read from the Bible in a moment. He didn't bring a Bible. He brought a poker chip. What kind of an idiot? He's speaking to an NFL football team in a locker room and he brings poker chips. They're losing. They're not doing very well. People are saying, Eli Manning's washed up. The minute you start losing, I'm telling you straight up, the minute you have a bad day, people are going to say, you don't have it anymore. You've lost it. They'll do it when you're 16. They'll do it when you're 25. They'll do it when you're 48. They don't even care. It don't matter your age. It don't matter. The minute they want to say something bad about you, and they were saying about him, and this guy said something. He said, in this game, in this game of poker, he goes, I don't, I don't even play poker, but they have a term that God wanted me to bring a word to you today. He said, the term is, in this game, when you believe what you have in your hand, when you believe that the cards you hold in your hand will win, you go all in. And he slid the chips across the table. <coughs> what does that mean? I don't know. Except they did. From then on, they went all in. They went up and they were just desperate enough. <coughs> They just had enough urgency that they said, they stopped and they said, why are we here? We're here to win football games. What are we doing? Somehow, we're listening to everybody else and not the real reason we're here. I'm going to take it straight up. If you're here, you're not here by accident. If you're here, it's not because of your parents. Well, it is. No, it is not, dude. No, it is not. If you're here, it's because of God. It is bigger than that. Because God knows you. You say, well, my parents make God put you in that family. He could if you got if you got a family that is strong in things of God, God puts you there for a reason. He also knows you're a stubborn, bullheaded person. And he puts you in a godly family because you would never make heaven without your mom. Neither would have I. Just be honest. Some of you say, I don't have a Christian family. God knew he would find you. He knew that even without a Christian family, you would serve him. <coughs> Our God is so amazing. He gives us everything we need so that every person on this planet can succeed. When I see someone that has a, a tough family, I'm like, I totally respect you because I know you must be stronger than me because God knew you would serve him regardless. <coughs> Some of you need like 17 preachers in your ear every day just for you to make heaven. And as you, others of you, if you had the Bible in a dark room, you would find God. But one thing that's in common with all of us, for us to serve God, there's days, many, we have to go all in. Don's going to read a scripture, and uh, I'm going to speak from the scripture. I'm an old guy, but I work with young people. That's kind of weird, huh? I once was young, and I worked with young people. Now I'm old. Guess what? I never graduated. I'm still working with young people. God's like, no, that's where you are. All my friends are like, hey, Z, when are you going to grow up? I'm kind of feeling like I'm growing up. Whatever God calls you to, He will enable you to do. God called a man named Moses. It's funny because I, I ate dinner with Moses. I was, I was getting jokes. The boys were giving me jokes. The, the boys were giving the old man jokes. And they were pretty funny jokes too. They weren't just kid jokes. Well, I don't know. The way they told them, I laughed. Maybe I was just in one of those moods. But this Moses led two and a half million people. And those two and a half million people didn't sense the urgency. And it 
almost destroyed. Donald, read Numbers chapter 16, verse 41. Numbers, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. The fourth book of the Bible. Go to chapter 16 and look for verse 41. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Those are Moses' books. He wrote them all. Book of Numbers, chapter 16, start with verse 41. Donna, come and read. The next day, the whole Israelite community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. You have killed the Lord's people, they said. But when the assembly gathered in op opposition to Moses and Aaron and turned towards the tent of meeting, suddenly the cloud covered it and the glory of the Lord appeared. Then Moses and Aaron went to the front of the tent of meeting and the Lord said to Moses, Get away from this assembly so I can put an end to them at once. And they fell face down. Then Moses said to Aaron, Take your censer and put incense in it, along with fire from the altar, and hurry to the assembly to make atonement for them. Wrath has come out from the Lord. The plague has started. So Aaron did as Moses said and ran into the midst of the assembly. The plague had already started among the people, but Aaron offered the incense and made atonement for them. He stood between the living and the dead, and the plague stopped. But 14,700 people died from the plague, in addition to those who had died because of Korah. Then Aaron returned to Moses at the entrance to the tent of meeting, for the plague had stopped. Say the word urgency. Urgency. Say it again. Urgency. I don't know if you've ever felt that in your life. Probably most of you haven't. But that word is a very powerful word. And when God puts it in your heart, it means something's going to happen. Not always good, but something's going to happen. Something's about to happen in this world, in this generation. But something already is happening. Let me read the statistics. I'm going to speak, but Nancy's going to do a dance at the end, for about 30 minutes. In the next 30 minutes, 209 kids will attempt suicide. 57 kids will run away from home. 14 teenage girls will give birth to babies outside of marriage. 22 teenage girls will get an abortion in the next 30 minutes. 685 teens will use a form of narcotics for the first time. 285 young people will be victims of a broken home. 288 kids will be sexually or physically abused by their parents. Every 15 seconds, a woman is kicked, punched, or beaten. A divorce is granted every 27 seconds. A woman is raped every 60 seconds. Urgency. We come to camp and we come here because we want you to have fun, but there's some nights you, someone needs to tell you the truth. Your generation is being attacked in every way. And some of you are some of those statistics I read. It won't happen to you in the next 30 minutes because you'll be here. And if you're here and God comes in a powerful way, you will be inoculated with a power inside you to deal with this kind of life. That's important. That's more important than playing games. That's more important than you being a good guy or a bad guy. That's more important. There's some warriors in this place, some true warriors of God that aren't just a good kid. In fact, you're probably a bad kid. You're probably on the border. You're probably making a decision. You're probably in a place right now where you think, man, they don't know what to do with me. Everybody would like to see you be good. They would like to see you be safe, but you're not safe. And God built you to not be safe. God built you to be a cause. I know that people probably don't speak this to you, but you know what? I don't have a whole lot of time on this planet. And I have seen God do so many miracles. I would be wrong when he puts an urgency in my heart to lay back and be a kind, nice little old man. There was a young man, his name was Dylan. He was in a youth camp like this. 
It was eight years ago. Eight years ago. And I was preaching at a youth camp eight years ago, and Dylan was there. I remember preaching in this camp, and God was moving in this camp. And it was a big building. And so every night we would be at the front, and there would be people praying around the, the altar of this building. And, and Dylan, man, he would always sit in the farthest back place he could find. And he came in, I remember him coming in, he wore these stinking cut off shorts. He was a big, heavy kid. Strong, big for his age. Bigger than me. Bigger than most of the men in this room. So it's kind of intimidating. You're like, how does somebody get built that big at that age? What tractor did he lift as a child to get that strong? And he's cut here and he's all tatted up. And he's tatted up with crappy tattoos like your, your cousin did when he was high on cocaine. Tatting him up. And it says, born to ride. Kill all kinds of all kinds of bad cuss words. They're all over him. And he's wearing the, tat the shorts as short as he can. It looks like Charles Barkley in the old days. <laughs> he's wearing the shorts all tied up here so like he could show them off. You're like... And he, you can see he did not like anybody that was in leadership. And I liked him. God, why did I like him? I hate that. Do you hate it? Do you hate it sometimes when you like someone? You know, they're not going to like you back. And God's like, this is your guy right here. This guy's going to do something for me. And I remember I preached every night. And Dylan said back there in the back. So the last night, I was so mad. I was frustrated. I want you to know, I'm not a real, sometimes I'm like, God, what? And I was just frustrated because he was just like joking around the whole time. It was like a big joke to him. My team was doing stuff. I mean, it was powerful. Like every kid in there, except Dylan and his four little homies, were like setting them. The little homies were just like wimps. Like, I could push them over. They, they, they weren't big at all. They were just there. They were scared of Dylan too, probably. So they were like there with him. Whatever you say, Dylan. I was like, whatever. And I thought, what's up with this youth group? Where's his youth pastor? What the heck is wrong with this guy? And then I find out the last day that he's not from a youth pastor. He's from... He's from a juvenile detention home. Somebody heard that Lloyd Ziegler was speaking. Like, that means something. Look at me. Short. Old. What? That, like, um, that's some kind of superhero. I think people come and they have some expectation that I can't even live up to. <laughs> Neither will you. But there's one that they see. And his name is God. I remember the last night I told all the counselors, you get all the kids in there early. And you take all the back rows, so that sucker has to sit on the front row. Mm -hmm. We're having a leadership meeting, and I'm talking like that. That's not really wise. I should be talking like a godly man. Instead, I'm going, just get to keep talk on you guys. I mean, let, let him sit in the back row. There was actually some couches back there. I wanted to sit there myself, honestly. But he's back there, and he sinks down on the couch, and he's all like, King Tut's brother. I'm like, what in the heck, dude? I, I'm tired of this stuff, and I'm preaching. So I can't get in the front row, but he, get, he has to get to the second, because they, they scan him in, got a bunch of old ladies in the back, and so he has to come here, and he's, you can see he's all ticked off. Like, what, who took our seats? Who? And I'm just like, I'm kind of like happy. Like, you're in the front row, I'm going to spit all over you, dude. I'm going to spit three rows back tonight when I preach. I'm like doing it. And I preach to him almost like this. And God said, I mean, like, I'm like, dude, I have an urgency for you. And I felt so stupid, too, but I could not help it. I was, a, I, was I, I knew that God wanted to do something. And I'm like, buddy, if you're going to hell, you're climbing over my spit, legs, Bible hitting you in the face. You know, I, I want to kill you myself. Like, if you're going to go, you're going tonight, brother. That's the way I felt. I felt like there's something about it. There's something about There's something in it. And you know what? At the end, I'm sitting there going, man, this guy is so hard. God, if you're real. And I remember preaching, and at the end of the sermon, I said something like this. He said, God can forgive all sin. And the, and the altar came, and people were all there. And he gets up. He gets up and he looks, like, I'm right here. People are praying. I'm saying, God, can forgive us? And I'm looking at him and he gets up and he walks and I'm like, maybe he's going to talk to me. And he looks at me like this. And Robbie turns his back like, and he starts to walk out and I'm sitting there going. And he turns around and he comes walking right at me like this. And I'm like, oh, heck, oh, heck. Oh, heck. 
your big bold preacher, not like here he comes, Satan himself coming upon me. I was like, God, give me a sword or something. I mean, we have dramas. Where's a drama sword? Bring that out here. I'll hit him with a Nerf ball. Give me something. And it's coming. I ain't got no weapon. He comes right up. He grabs me by the shoulders and he says, Can God forgive all sin? And I'm like, where's the stupid youth pastors at, man? Why? I'm just the speaker. And I'm like, yes, he can. Dylan, God can forgive all sin. More like this. Dylan. <laughs> you know what? He goes, I want to tell you something. And he pushes me back like this and sets me down on the altar. It wasn't a stage. It was a little higher than that. I'm sitting on the altar like a little kid. And he's like looking at me. And he kneels down in front of me. And he says, You don't know my story, man. And I'm just like, no, I don't. Now everything goes away. The urgency. I don't have to be urgent. Here's the moment. The moment is here. And I go, What happened to you? He goes, my dad, I was not his favorite. And I looked at him like, no kidding. <laughs> because he's a mean person. And he goes, but I really tried hard. And then I broke inside and I started crying. I'm like, man, Dylan, I'm so sorry. And he goes, I wanted to drive the car so bad when I was 16 years of age. I always was kind of a problem kid. I always did my own thing. I wasn't really bad, but, you know, I went and got the car. And my dad told me, don't take the car. And I pushed the garage door, and the garage door opened. And I started the car, and I put it in reverse, and I tried to back up slowly, but I didn't know how to drive it, so I pushed too hard. And the car shot out of the garage, and my little brother was riding his tricycle. And I ran over my baby brother, and I killed my baby brother. And then my mom had to come out of the house screaming, and my dad came out. My dad looked right at me, I'll never forget it. He said, you're a baby killer, Dylan. You're a baby killer. We can't live with a baby killer. And I cried so bad, and we did his funeral. And I went to school about three days later from his funeral. When I came home, my parents had moved. I lived in the house, and then I lived in the alley behind the house and lied to the school and made them feel like I was still living somewhere. And I stayed at some people's houses, and then someone found out, and they put called CPS. And then I got put in this home, and that home, and this home, and that home. And this man abused me, this person did this to me, and then I got on drugs, and then I got this girl pregnant, and then, and then I hit this guy with a frying pan, and he got hurt, I got a felony, I don't know like, I'm like, heck, dude. And it's just like, he goes, I just started falling apart. He goes, can God really forgive a baby killer? And I said, God can forgive all sin. And Dylan prayed right there. And he got up that next morning before camp closed and he gave the most powerful testimony of God I've ever heard in my life. That's urgency. I, I felt that that night. Eight years ago, I felt that tonight and I haven't felt that for eight years. There's somebody here that God really wants to reach you. He loves you so much. He read a book of numbers. It was Moses. The people, the Israelites, the people of God were complaining. Something has never changed. That's the beauty of the Bible. They're complaining. They're griping. Three million of them, two and a half million. Complaining about the leadership. Complaining that... The leadership is trying to make them spiritual. It always amazes me. The church is, we're looking for a pastor. Pastor Lloyd, 
you have any master's students that are a pastor? We're looking for a pastor. Well, what are you looking for? I want a guy that will preach the fire of God. We want a guy that will be passionate for God. We want a guy that will be uncompromising. We want a man that will, will change, will reach the unsaved. We want a man that will feed the hungry. We want a man that will come here and give it all and give his life. And then we get that man and they go, he preaches too hard. He preaches too passionate. He preaches too long. He's too serious. He doesn't have enough funny things. Why doesn't he do this? Why is he always trying to reach the lost and bring the homeless and the hurting? What's wrong with the guy? That's what you wanted. That's a man of God. That's a woman of God. That's what it takes. That's what God chooses. That's all he's got. The other things, they're not even his. They're just professionals. When God calls somebody, he has an urgency. He sends somebody to make a difference, and they don't get to look cool, and they don't get to play a game, and they don't get to do their own thing. They have to listen to God. That's still his business. It's never changed. But here's what I like. The people are complaining. Will Rogers said, people change, but not much. That's true. You can't expect people to change drastically unless God does it. Because without God, no man, no woman, no program, no youth group, no camp, no church, no preacher can change people like that. But our God, He is into drastic deliverance, drastic transformation, drastic change. He's a powerful God. That urgency came upon Moses and Aaron. Check this out. I love God. This is why I love God. God says, oh, you want to gripe? He's telling his own people, the children of Israel, the, the people that Moses is leading, the people that Abraham came from, the, the people that King David, all the people we preach, those, that group of people, three million of them, he goes, you want to gripe? You want to complain? This is God. Cool. I'll just kill you. I wish that would happen. Uh, wouldn't that be cool? I mean, like, we have an attitude at camp, and God just starts killing people. Boom, bang, boom, bang. And we put it on CNN. The whole Canada would straighten up. Boom. God's killing people. <laughs> Going down the street, pull up to a house. Hey, how you doing? Bang, 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 bang. You're, you're dead. They get some kind of disease. <laughs> Follower, God's like, bang, gotcha. Oh, I love that. I'm like, bring it, bring that. That would pretty well bring a revival. Because all of you that go, well, I don't know, Pastor Wood. I don't know, man. Z, I, you don't understand. I, you'd be like, oh God, oh Jesus, hallelujah. Your unsafe father would be, oh hallelujah, hallelujah. The drunk up the street would be, oh glory, glory, deliverance. I mean, it would be like, why? Because God is powerful. He took that for His own people. Like, that's funny. Nah, it's not funny if it started happening. It happened. This is a real Bible. This isn't a joke. God started. He going, okay, I won't kill you. People, can you imagine? We're at camp. Right here. Elijah, you started out. You're the first. No, Donald, you're the first man in. God goes, I'll start from this side of the building. Boom. Bang. You're gone, actually. It's over. Elijah, oh, you're so. You come, David, bang, you're gone. It's over. You guys are gone. This row is already dead. They're over. It's coming right here. Bang. Not you. Not you. I love this guy. He's on. Bang. He's gone. He's gone. He's gone. And, and here's what. That's what's going on. This is the Bible. The Bible is unbelievable. And there was an urgency. And Moses goes, Aaron, man, get to the tent of meeting. Go get some fire from God off the altar. Get the sensor that holds the fire and run out into the crowd. A person asked me this. It was a person that asked me a question in a youth meeting and he said, can one person make a difference? I did have an answer for him. Can one person make a difference? I didn't have an answer. I said, oh yeah, I said, well, I said the Christian there. Oh, yes, definitely. But I didn't have the scripture. I didn't, I didn't have the places in my mind of the, 
of where one person made a difference. This scripture is the best scripture. Because this kid that asked me that question, he gave his life to God. Even though I didn't have an answer. I wasn't smart enough. I didn't study enough. I wasn't prepared enough. But somehow he gave his life to God and drowned four days later. 